We'll go ahead and call this special workshop or the city workshop meeting to order. I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, Mayor Phillips sends his regret. He cannot be with us this evening. He's a bit under the weather. Um, before you, you have a uh, agenda. We have today two items. Uh, without any questions or changes, we'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Move for adoption of the agenda. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. We'd like to to welcome Judge Hardison. Thank you for being with us this evening. Dr. Richard Woodruff, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council. This evening, the first item on our workshop is discussion of a possible new program relative to pre-child intervention. We're certainly honored this evening to have Judge Hardison with us. I apologize, your name? Brendan Gardner. Uh, also with, with Brendan Gardner. And I'd like to ask at this time that the Chief of Public Safety, Mike Canera, uh, introduce the program, and then the two of them will give you more detail. Thank you. Please. Sure, I'll be glad to. What we're going to talk about tonight is, is something that, um, <clears throat> that's, that's sort of new for us. Uh, this is a formal pre-arrest diversion program. Right now, uh, the court has a post-arrest diversion program. So if somebody is charged with a crime, they can be diverted from that, um, <clears throat> from that charge post-arrest. And uh, there's, there's some good things about that, and there's some bad things. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about several of those because we're looking at a pre-arrest diversion program. And actually tonight we're going to talk about really two different kinds of programs. The first program is a misdemeanor diversion program that, uh, that will be pre-arrest. And the other is the LEADS program. The LEADS program uh, talks about mental health. But uh, the first program that we'll talk about is the misdemeanor uh, arrest program. And there's a, there's a number of alternatives to arrest. So really within the law, it gives police officers, when, they, when, they're, when they're considering making arrest, a number of alternatives that they can use um, prior to actually making the arrest. So this program capture, cap, cap, capitalizes on the ability for officers to make those decisions in the field and uh, that makes it an alternative to arrest. And these are just for low-level offenses. This could be like shoplifting, possession of alcohol by a person under the age of 18, um, possession of si simple possession of marijuana, uh, simple affray, uh, you know, a fight in school or something similar to that. <clears throat> it also, when we talk about incarceration and in prosecution, most of that is in, is avoided by these uh, by post arrest, and it's also avoided by pre arrest. So. The thing about somebody who has been arrested, in most states, that arrest record follows that person throughout their lives. So when we talk about this alternative to an arrest, what it does is it gives somebody a second chance. So if they're caught with possession of marijuana or they're caught with underage drinking, this program would not give them a criminal record. Um, even though records can be expunged, it can be rather expensive and it's rather time consuming. So a lot of time people that don't have resources, resources to hire an attorney, they can't, they can't get their, their, um, their record expunged. And when we talk about even, even officers that we hire, a lot of times we, we turn away qualified applicants because of some arrest they had uh, as, a, as a very young person. And this diversion is not, not anything new. The ICP recommends it. They talk about uh, minimizing the criminal uh, involvement for youth, and, and they support this as a best practice. <clears throat> so part of Part of our concern is the growing correctional system. And you can see over the last 10 years in this, in this particular slide, there's been an increase of people on probation, people going to prison, and people uh, being on parole. 
first time offense in North Carolina for 16 and 70 year olds, there were 18,000 offenses. Now, for us, we've charged about 200, or, or, or excuse me, 464 youth in our community were charged w as, as adults in adult court that were 16 and 17 year olds. Now, these folks would be prime candidates for, for low level offenses for this pre arrest diversion program. <clears throat> Only 5% of that 18,000 were violent crimes. So we're not talking about violent crimes. We're not talking about armed robbery. We're not talking about rape. We're not talking about murder. What we're talking about are very, very low level offenses. <clears throat> so a misdemeanor diversion program is what we're talking about occurs pre-arrest and pre-charged. The participants won't have any criminal record in the criminal justice system. Now, how this program would work is that the officer would pre-arrest, pre-arrest, he would refer them to, to a, a program. If they complete the program, the charge would be dismissed. So there wouldn't be any record, any criminal record, of that person being charged. And right now what we're looking at is we've had some discussion between the school system, the, the judge and the police department about um, establishing this to target 16 and 17 year olds. There's a couple things I think that we want to do. First is we want to be successful. So we're going to really start out slow. Um, the judge and Brennan and Sergeant Silence with our department spent uh, several days in California, um, in uh, Los Angeles, and they were able to go to a conference and talk about best practices. And I think one of the messages that comes back from that, that conference was that we really want to start slowly so that we're really successful with this program. And, and I think we can be successful with this program. And I think the most important part that we're going to really talk about is um, let's see, the recidivism rate. So the recidivism rate for these types of programs are six are forty percent versus six percent. So if if somebody commits a crime and they go through the program, six percent of those would will reoffend. If they don't go through the program, about 40% will go through or will reoffend. So when we when we're talking about this program, what we're talking about is reducing recidivism, and that's probably the most important piece of this entire program. Is if we can get these kids the first time, uh, and I and I because they're younger than my son, I, I think about them as kids. If we can get these kids into programs. And, and get them on the right track, then we can reduce the amount of recidivism so they're not reoffending over and over again. And if we break that cycle, that's really what we're after. You know, that's, that's the whole reason we make the arrest. That's the whole reason we prosecute them in court. That's the whole reason for the court system is to try to change their behavior. But if we can change that behavior prior to that, that arrest and use the system to make them to to make them uh, less likely to, you know, it's it's something that I feel that we should be looking at, and I I think it's something that I feel would be very beneficial for us to look at when we talk about reductions of crime in our community, because if you look at our crime rate, you know, I I I, I spend a lot of time looking at what what kinds of crimes we commit, property crimes by far are our most serious problems. Auto burglaries, burglaries, shoplifting, uh, petty larceny. Those calls, those, those, those cases are what we spend the majority of our time on. <clears throat> you know, we're very lucky that we have a very low violent crime rate, not like other, other communities um, within our state. But I think what we can do with a program like this is even make it lower by looking at how we can, how we can effectively take these kids 
who have made one mistake and, and look at a program or look at a process that we can get them on the straight and narrow and hopefully, hopefully keep them out of uh, jail and also hopefully not affect that one decision, not affect their, their, um, the, their likelihood for a good job, their likelihood to go to college. You know, I talked to one, one young man who's trying to get in medical school who'd had several offenses that were related to alcohol when he was 16, 17 years old in North Carolina. It's an, you're treated as an adult, you know, and he was having problems getting into medical school. So this kind of program would allow us, would allow us to be able to uh, effectively pre-arrest these people and put them into a diversion program. And I think it'd be more effective. It'd be more effective for us. It'd be more effective for the community, and it would be better for the community. So uh, we're honored here to have uh, Judge Hardison, if he'd like to say a few words before we talk about the, the LEADS program. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. I just spoke with Judge Jay Corpening, who is the Chief District Court Judge for the 5th District, and that's Wilming, New Hanover County, and Pender. Pender County. And he is one of the individuals that has spearheaded this program in this portion of the state. As a matter of fact, he has become part of the National Panelist Presentation Group. And in speaking with him over the last year, He's observed a 47% reduction in the crimes that have been committed in school. And as a result, you have a number of students who now, instead of being sent home, stay in school. Because when you send them home, devil's mind is, is workshop. Idle mind is a devil's workshop. And so in reviewing some of his statistics, it appears that a number of young people who were in this program have been able to remain in school and actually improve their performance in school. Whereas in the past, where individuals had been arrested, a number of them were arrested and then became members of one of the, I think said 20 gangs that they have in Wilmington now. And in addition to that, the state of North Carolina, through Chief Justice Martin, Commission on, on Justice, is implementing and going to mandate that 16 and 17 year olds no longer be tried as adult in many offenses. And so juveniles up to the age of 16, 15 and below, their records are closed. So when they are involved in a process like this, that program, once they've completed whatever it is, that program is sealed unless as an adult they commit additional crimes and then some law enforcement agency may have to refer back to their history to see if there's anything that needs to be included in the predisposition sentencing phase. But this program, as outlined, is a program that's designed to reduce the amount of arrests, to reduce the involvement in crime, to reduce the number of kids mm -hmm. who get involved in the criminal justice system. Right now, we're at the infant stage. We're still in the planning stage because we have the chief who is in 100% support of this program. We have the sheriff who has indicated his support and the superintendent has indicated his support. So these will be some of the key members along with speaking with the district attorney at some point in time to see if there are any specific recommendations he may have. And then once that uh, understanding is met, then there will be a formal writing, a memorandum of understanding, and there will be formal training provided for the officers how to respond in certain cases, certain situations. So the program is really going to be a benefit, we believe and we hope. And as it's not going to take off soon, but we're going to gradually put it together so that once it is put together, like I said, we're going to start out slow, 
We will probably begin it in the city because those officers, the city police officers will probably be trained first as to how to approach situations and whether there's a diversion to counseling or whether there's diversion to therapy or any other recommended treatment. And so that is how it stands at the present time. And probably Brendan can give you the statistics of the number of individuals that this might affect. But I can say this, with the age changing in the state of North Carolina, raising the age to 18 and leaving 16 and 17 year olds not being tried as adult. We were in a chief's meeting yesterday afternoon, and as I understand it, I think it's approximately 1.2 million students can be affected by that change in age. And that's in the state of North Carolina. And if you take the statistics from J Judge Corpinus and you reduce that by almost 50%, you can see how much of a success this program may be. I think um, one of the things that struck me when we were out at our conference in, in California was not just um, when a student goes, uh, is arrested at school and has to go stand in front of Judge Hardison, but even when they just go through that arrest process, you know, forget if they even go any further with that, that they decide not to pursue it. Even going through just the arrest process makes them significantly more likely to, to reoffend. And so it's not just those that are convicted, not just those that even, you know, go on, on a, you know, a post-arrest diversion program. We want to avoid that. We want to, we want to, to get to the root of the problem. And we looked at our, our arrests in Onslow County schools, you know, and, and we're arresting a little over 100 students a year, sometimes more, sometimes fewer. And more often than not, they are very minor offenses, some of the offenses that that Chief Unero was alluding to, you're talking about minor, you know, very small drug possession, uh, a fray, uh, disorderly conduct is our most common um, form of, of arrest in, in the school system. And like Chief Unero, it's, it's a small mistake that a lot of people made. They did a, an exercise. The um, a former deputy commissioner of the Philadelphia Police Department did an exercise and just basically did an anonymous poll. And we're in a room full of educational professionals, judges, law enforcement officers, and and had them anonymously write down crimes that they committed when they were younger. And the list was impressive. And the difference between where they are now, successful people, and somebody is just luck that this person got caught and this person didn't. And it shouldn't be less they shouldn't be left up to luck. And so that's part of this program, understanding that students make mistakes, understanding the kids make mistakes. Their brains aren't where they need to be. They're more more apt to, to, to partake in at-risk behaviors and, and take those chances. And we shouldn't let them, uh, we shouldn't let it affect them for the rest of their lives because the, the effects of a simple arrest like that, disorderly conduct could lead to what they call collateral consequences. Driver's license, a job, purchasing a firearm, getting into the military, all those things long-term for, for one small moment of poor judgment. And, and we really want to get away from that. And, and this program, is, is, is moving in the right direction for that and, and to really get the focus back on kids and keeping them in school so we can get them down to doing what we need to do and what they need to do. Thank you. Now, will this program, as it, so basically you're still molding the program in terms of what what the actual program will consist of? Is yeah, that? I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to speak for the judge, but, <laughs> but uh, I, I think our goal is to to move rather slowly to, to look at, at what kind of programs we're going to be uh, directing those folks to um, and also what the program is going to look like. How We know we're going to start out in the schools, but uh, so how long are we going to stay in the schools and then move it out to the officer on the street? Um, I think, I think, uh, I think there's a good, it's a good plan to start in the schools. But I also think that this program could have some real value for officers on the street that catch catch a young uh, a young kid with uh, you know shoplifting, larceny, things like that. So, um, you know, I, I I think it's it's probably aggressive to think that we will be able to start this in September, but it's going to take it's going to take some planning. It's going to take some real effort in order to get it uh, because. 
one of the things that I learned about police work and police officers uh, after 30 some years is that uh, for a program like this to be effective, they have to believe in it because they have a lot of discretion on the field. So we want to we want to make sure that that it's it's going to be successful, and and it's going to be worth it. I think because when you look at a six percent versus a forty percent uh, recidivism rate, I mean th those are those are real numbers in North Carolina. That's the uh, Durham program, and uh, it, it 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 will reduce our crime rate, and it'll be good for our community. Who has the, or maybe it hasn't been decided yet, but the, the decision to enter someone into the uh, pre-program, who will make that decision? Well, what we'll do is, as a, as a group, and, and, uh, and the judge is kind of spearheading that, is that we'll identify those offenses that we will look at for the pre-arrest program. So we'll look at those offenses, and then we'll, we'll, we'll farm that out to the officers, train them, and say, these are the offenses that, uh, that, we'll, that we will accept as far as that, this pre-arrest diversion program. So that'll be, a, that'll be kind of a collaboration between the school system and other, and other stakeholders in the community so that, uh, that we make sure that we've, we've kind of looked at it and said, you know, because there's, there's a lot of discussion about for example, gun offenses. I mean, if, if, if somebody's caught with a gun without a permit, are you going to allow them to go through the program or are you not going to allow them to go through the programs? So I think when we get, when we get that together and, and start to discuss that, um, I think, you know, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have all the, uh, all, the, all the stakeholders in the room and we'll kind of look at what offenses are going to be and then what offense and and how and how we'll handle those offenses whether the police department will do some i mean with our crisis counselor obviously we can do some things in house uh, whether it be re referred to somebody like uh, uh, the pretrial services how how that how that whole process is going to work so uh, you know I, we want we want to make this slow just like i'm going to talk about the leads program you know we, we met with uh, we met with the Harm Reduction Coalition today to talk about about another pre-arrest diversion program that we'll be w working on. It has to do with mental health and substance abuse. <clears throat> but again, we're moving slowly, and we're going to make sure that all our partners are in the room with us when we start to talk about how that program is going to work as well. And one other thing, in Durham and in most other areas that has that have implemented this program. Say the officer decides this is an offense. This young person needs to participate in the program. Well, if he, that individual is arrested, they are scheduled a court date. Then when they come to court, it's a question of whether or not they want to proceed with without an attorney. So then we've got another continuous. Then on the court date, the attorney may not be ready yet to proceed, so then you have another continuance. And then by the time it's disposed of, it's so far away from the time it occurred. In situations like this, if an officer decides this individual needs to be in a program, in Durham, you receive a slip. You have 72 hours to report. So there's immediate response to whatever the behavior was. If that individual does not show up or does not participate, then that officer is going to issue the arrest charge. So there will be consequences. And in Durham, I think the last, the last session that they spoke about, out of 90 individuals, they had three that did not complete the program. And so the matter gets resolved quicker, the issue is addressed sooner, and that way the child or the individual can relate to why and what's happening, and that helps to also reduce the amount of recidivism, and, and it keeps the process moving without excessive delay. Relative to the role that the city council uh, would play in this, uh, 
I, I believe that what you're doing is presenting this as general information for the city council. The decision to set up the program, I do not believe is within the purview of the mayor and council. It's really within the purview of the judicial system. Is that correct or incorrect? Well, it will be a combination because the General Assembly, well, the director of the administrative officers of the court has given directions to all the chief judges that this program is going to affect and it needs to be implemented. However, there's not a specific timeline. It has to be implemented by the state. But this is an effort to statewide implement this program and help to see if it's going to be effective enough to continue. And based on the information we've received thus far from Durham County, New Hanover County, uh, I think Wayne County and Wake. Uh, uh, Wayne County and Lenore County is in the process of implementing theirs. Wake County has it. Uh, Orange County, Chatham County has it, and I think there's another county. I think Guilford County is in the process of implementing it. So it's in its infant stage, even through the other agencies, other. Uh, districts. Some of them have begun, and so from those we also would get ideas as to what works, what doesn't work, what are the most effective ways, and we're going to use a culmination of all of these to help put this into action, because there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We just want it to roll smoother. John? Well, I didn't get to go to California, <laughs> but I did get to go to the uh, Center for Public Safety and hear the Durham presentation. And uh, they have two staff persons there that are work and, and uh, the work the program. Uh, Diane Jones, who's with us tonight, she is uh, head of the pretrial diversion program here in Onslow County in the 4th District. Uh, and Bill Ross, former probation officer, and Colonel Bob Schweitzer over there. But Diane, I think, with Judge Hardison and those folks put this program on, and it was an excellent presentation. Uh, I think that uh, from what I recall, there's a funding issue because of whether it's run under Diane's uh, program now, the pretrial, or, or if it's a new setup, there's an issue that this has kind of been a mandate judge with insufficient or no funds. And so, I, but to let the council know, you already participate and you already uh, make a contribution to the pretrial resources. So at some point in time when it's kind of uh, the meat's put on the bones, there'll probably be another presentation to let you know exactly what's going on and to see if the city would contribute in some way to, to help in that way. Is that a fair sure. summary? I have to defer to the chief on that one. <laughs> okay. Well, basically, we would be, they would be seeking additional yes. funding for the program. For and this that's, program. And that's basically why we're here in the presentations mm -hmm. tonight, and um, um, we've asked for it to come forward for that reason. Um, and again, it's a great way to help our youth get on the right path. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm fully supportive of it at this point. Well, let, um, let's kind of get into the second yeah, part of uh, if it's all right and we'll talk about the leads program because the leads program is very similar it's not the same but it's very similar and this 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 chart just shows you the percentage of the population uh, people in uh, state prison and jail who have some type of alcohol or drug disorder and those with serious mental illnesses so a law enforcement assisted diversion program is similar to the program that we just talked about. But this is, this is people with all walks of life. And what the, the LEADS program is, is people that either are, uh, have some type of substance abuse or mental health need are, reser are, are referred to social services. I know we're kind of running kind of tight on time. But what, what this program does is it will allow the officers to refer those folks to some type of, of uh, social service. And I think this program is going to kind of dovetail onto what we're working on right now, what, what the task force has been working on as far as the crisis intervention center. So this will be a program where 
uh, officers who, who find people with low, again, with low level offenses, public drunkenness, uh, possession, small possession of marijuana, you know, something that's related to the mental health. You know, we, we answered around 900 calls where somebody was mentally challenged last year. Some of those offenses, some of those people were taken to jail. Um, those people would be diverted into this LEADS program, and they would, would be required to go through some type of substance abuse or, or mental health training or some, some type of program to try to, uh, try to resolve whatever the issue is. Are they not taking their medication? Do they need detox? Whatever that, whatever that might be. So as kind of a parallel track to what, to what uh, uh, Mary, you've been working on with, uh, with Councilman Thomas, um, this program, we would hope, would be uh, ready to go live when our uh, crisis intervention center is open that we can refer them or take them directly to there instead of to jail or to the hospital and hopefully uh, hopefully get some, some people that, who have uh, either some type of mental illness or some type of uh, uh, substance abuse problem some help. And I think... <clears throat> I think that, um, again, when we talk about the impact on recidivism, you know, the people that participate in this program are less likely to be arrested within uh, after they complete the program. So I think from a, a crime prevention standpoint, both of these programs will have a, a tremendous impact on our re-arrest rate, which will overall reduce our crime rate. And I think it'll be better for our community. So these two programs are, are things that over the next year, over the next several months, that we will be uh, really focusing on trying to get them implemented, especially in, in, in light of the crisis center being uh, targeted for some time in the, uh, the wintertime. Thank you. Let's take just a minute. Um, Mike mentioned the work that the task force, the mental health task force, which is made up of two county commissioners and two city council members. Council member Thomas, Mayor Pro Tem Alizera, also uh, Commissioner Knapp, Commissioner Price. We've now had three meetings. We'll have a fourth meeting tomorrow evening out at the county. We're making good progress. Harry Brown has put in the state budget. Hopefully it will be finalized and adopted. Uh, facility improvement money, which comes from the sale of the Dorothy Dix uh, property, uh, you know, in the past. The operational budget is currently being analyzed. We have provided the council with copies of the minutes of each of our meetings. At a point in time, the most likely in August, we will be prepared to bring back to city council an overview of the task force work and also discuss funding requirements. But I have to commend the two council members and the two commissioners for taking this task on or the focus that the county and the city are both giving to this. But we do want to tell you that most likely your first or second meeting in August, we will be prepared to give you a full report relative to mental health in this new crisis center. Council member, Mayor Pro Tem, you want to add uh, anything to No, that? I think it was well said, and I think <clears throat> all, these, all these programs that we're talking about will all go hand in hand, and at, at the end of the day is to create a better community and to give people in need an opportunity not to have a second chance if that's if that's what they're looking for. And uh, I think that both these programs are well needed in our community and pretty successful in a lot of other communities, as you indicated earlier, especially for these youths that have these minor issues, but then because of the way we currently do things, they feel that they can't move on with their life. And, and I think that creates more and more problems within a, within a community. And, and I think these are excellent ways to give people another opportunity to get, get themselves back together. And uh, so I'm very excited about it. And I want to thank you for all the work you've done. And Judge, thank you for being with us today and, and helping with this program. The last comment before we move to the next agenda item. The city greatly values and appreciates the current pretrial intervention program. I don't want anyone to think that these alternative programs are in competition. They're intended to be complementary. I would also want you to understand that from a management standpoint, 
we are not going to ask you to raid the money that currently goes to fund pretrial intervention to help fund these. We will need to find the additional money. But I want to publicly state that the city values the current pretrial program. It is very important for this community. It is very important for the people who go through it. We see these tools which have been identified tonight as additional ways for us to address the problems that we're facing as a society. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Chief, thank you. Thank you guys for being with us. Thanks. Have a good day. Do we have time for the... This will only take a okay. second. Um, under the council manager form of government, the city manager is authorized to direct the staff and determine the various activities and assignments. Over the last several months, as we have looked at the retirement of uh, Reginald Goodson, who was the director of a fairly large department, We've also looked at the analysis relative to the workload in those departments. What we know is that when you look at development services, it includes code enforcement, it includes community development, it includes planning and permitting and those type things. We know that growth in the city is slowing down. Fortunately, we've had a lot of commercial growth, but residential growth, as you know, is slowed. We also know that we are facing the potential loss of community development block grant money totally. We do know from information received just this past week that it is in next year's federal budget. It is $15,000 less than what was shown to you when we went through the budget. But we also know that if Congress is, is moving on the path that they appear to move, be moving on with the president, that a year from now we will not have a community development block grant program. That will mean that we will have program income, but our program will not nearly be as large as it is. As a manager, every time a vacancy occurs in almost every position, now certainly not firefighters or police officers or sanitation workers, but almost every vacancy, the first rule we have under this management team is we analyze, do you really need it? And do you need it in the form that you used to have it? The time to make change is when things are vacant. A department director over this department uh, costs the city about $120,000 a year. That's through salary and benefits. When I looked at the role that Reggie played, and he played a very important role, but I look ahead at what I think the city is going to be facing what I'm preferring to do is reorganize that department. We did a very similar thing uh, several years ago when Tim Chestnut left us as the Parks and Recreation Director. So what I'm proposing, and I'm not asking you to vote to approve it because I don't believe that it's required that you vote. Yeah, I am required to inform you of the changes. So this is what we're looking at for the future. We will divide that department into two smaller departments. You will have one, and without my glasses, I'm going to move closer to the TV screen. You will see that you will no longer have development services. What you will have is community engagement department, where code enforcement, community programs, and livable neighborhoods community development and Office of Livable Neighborhoods will be in that section, that department. You will then have a planning and inspections department where you will have planning, permitting, and inspections. And instead of having those divisions the report to a department director who reports to the city manager, we're simply flattening the organization. I believe that the skill set that you have in the manager's office between Ron and John and Glenn and myself, that we're very capable of flattening this organization. So what I'm doing tonight is what I believe I'm required to do, but also what I want to do. And that is to explain to you the managerial decision on how we're going to restructure the organization. Now, I'd like to ask John, do you believe that the council has to vote on this, or do you believe that the manager has the authority to do this? Yeah, I think that they allocate so many positions, and you can spread that out. And, again, if they're not happy, you know what happens. 
So we're 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 good. We're good. <laughs> Any Do you questions? have questions about it? A lot of which are, I really appreciate. A lot of our most recent ordinances and codes have included a phraseology that certain things could be appealed to the development services director. So who, where, where is that? Who is that person going to be now? I mean, is that you know I'm asking there because there used to yes. be there could be like, like an appeal or his determination could you know pr provide some relief to an applicant. Who's going to make those calls now? Well, I believe that if you go further into UDO, what the UDO says is that should titles change. But okay. I'm going to refer we, we, that we to the city attorney. This. We've talked about this. And right <clears throat> now it goes to Ron. Okay. Because right. if you recall, and I think Richard even reported this to you, that uh, it, it, let's say Ryan right. is the, the head person there, but he's the one who they need to appeal from. And so Ron is that person. And if we need to go back and do anything with the UDO, we'll be bringing it to you to to tweak that, uh, but but again, that's the the concept is it would go from Brian as the uh, decision maker if he's at that position, and then Ron would be that. But then it would go to the manager uh, ultimately. But that would take that place. Any other questions? Okay. Motion to adjourn. adjourn. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All favor? Oh, second. Second. All right. 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 Ladies and <laughs> Thank you.